The terror of the nuclear threat was used again in October 1962. In 1957, Alice Bailey had suggested that the threat of use of the atomic bomb would be enough to intimidate the Church of Rome to make it obey the orders of the world powers. The nuclear tests conducted by the United States and the Soviet Union resumed in 1962 and were more numerous than any other similar period of time before or after. The terror of the atomic bomb coincided with the second week of the Second Vatican Council, when not only the cardinals, but most of the bishops of the world were gathered in Rome. Moreover, on October 15, 1962, only four days after the opening of the Council, American reconnaissance aircraft discovered several installations of Soviet medium-range missiles in Cuba, believed to be able to carry out a first nuclear attack on dozens of cities of the United States. On October 22, just 11 days after the start of the Council, President Kennedy revealed to the nation the presence of Soviet missiles in Cuba. The Cuban Missile Crisis paralyzed the world that remained in suspense. What the world did not know however, was that there could be no Russian missile in Cuba, capable of hitting U.S. cities, if the U.S. itself had not transferred a particular roller-bearing technology to the Soviet Union, necessary to build missile guidance systems. Investigative journalist Anthony Sutton, in his book, The Best Enemy You Can Buy, revealed that, in 1961, the Commerce Department approved the export of 35 centerline B ball bearing machines of the Bryant Chucking Grinder Company, for the processing of miniature ball bearings, to the Soviet Union, which would have given the Soviets the chance to reach 50% of U.S. capacity. The Soviets had no equipment for this mass production, and neither the USSR nor any other European manufacturer was able to produce such equipment. With the help of the United States government, the Soviet communists suddenly had ballistic missiles with nuclear capabilities parked just 90 miles south of Key West, Florida. Thus, the Soviet army, technologically primitive of the 1960s, was instantly updated by its alleged opponent, the United States, becoming a bogeyman far more frightening than it had been up to that point. If the American people were terrified with the prospect of a nuclear war, the European people were even more so. The Europeans who still had the vivid memories of the incinerated cities and of the millions of bodies of innocent people, women, children and the elderly, following the Allied bombing raids, during the Second World War. With good reason then, were the inhabitants of Rome frightened, when they learned that the United States, as a retaliation against Russian missiles in Cuba, had installed medium-range missiles in the U.S. Air Force Base at Joya del Corle, only 300 miles south of the Eternal City. Thus, it was guaranteed that the capital of Italy would be one of the first targets of a Soviet retaliatory attack in a total nuclear war. Virtually unnoticed by the faithful, during this orchestrated clash of Cold War between the Soviet Union and the United States, there was another show of strength that took place in the early days of the Second Vatican Council. The initial traditional preparatory schemes of the Council, which had been painstakingly organized for two years by a group of Orthodox prelates under the guidance of Archbishop Domenico Tardini, were dumped in the waste bin, to make way for a radical revolutionary program. A new series of schemes, tailored to the anti-church, and secretly drafted by the agents of the Synagogue of Satan, long before the Council, were then implemented, with the connivance of John XXIII. Although Ron Carley remained in the shadows, in utilizing this betrayal, his part in the sabotage of the authentic schemes of the Council did not escape the traditionalist, and conservative cardinals, especially those who knew they were dealing with an anti-pope. But Ron Carley's betrayal of the Council Fathers took a back seat, as soon as he was raised to the world stage as the great peacemaker for having overcome the Cuban Missile Crisis. Obviously all this was prepared by his controllers and press officers, Ron Carly first proposed to the Kremlin, then to Washington, that the missiles in Italy be removed in exchange for the dismantling of Soviet missiles in Cuba. During the crisis, the American people were informed only of the removal of American missiles in Turkey, as an exchange offered to the Russians. But in Italy, the conciliar fathers and the faithful, who were wary of Roncalli, were suddenly reluctant to criticize the peacemaker Pope, who saved Italy and the Western world from nuclear holocaust. 
The real war waged by the Masonic cabal that ran the Washington, D.C. government, was a secret war against the Church and an open war against Catholic nations. The hatred of the American government for all that was Catholic was matched only by that of their protégés in the Kremlin, who had killed thousands of Catholic priests and faithful, not to mention the millions of Russian Orthodox Christians, since 1917. But the anti-Pope peacemaker was nothing but an agent of the twin governments that were enemies of the Church of Christ, and had been imposed as Pope to pave the way for the advent of the Kingdom of the Antichrist and, subsequently, to obscure the intellects of over half a billion Catholics, depriving them of the sanctifying grace at its source, the Church's sacraments in order to then deliver the final blow. The total elimination of Christ's sacrifice on the cross to replace it with the Gnostic redemption of the blasphemous and satanic Masonic Triple Trinity. In fact, besides the papacy, the main and final objective of the enemies of the Church of Christ has always been the holy sacrifice of the Mass, as the Latin axiom reminds us, Tola Papam, Tola Missom, take away the Pope and the Holy Mass will be suppressed. Upon the death of John XXIII, at the subsequent conclave of 1963, Cardinal Giuseppe Siri was elected, but this is what the president of that conclave, Prince Scottisco, wrote on June 21, 1963. During the conclave, a cardinal came out of the Sistine Chapel, met with representatives of the Binai Breath, and announced to them the election of Cardinal Siri. They responded by saying that the persecutions against the Church would be resumed immediately. Returning to the conclave, he had Montini elected. What did these immediate persecutions against the Church consist of? Before his death in July 1999, the former Jesuit, writer and perennial insider of the Vatican, Malachi Martin, cryptically admitted that, during the conclave of 1963, a criminal intervention occurred immediately after the papal election of Siri, by means of a terrible external threat to annihilate the Vatican. Martin clearly stated that, it is certain that in the voting of the conclave of 1963, Siri had collected the necessary number of votes to be elected Pope, but the election was shelved by what has been called the little brutality. After three days of the conclave, Montini emerged as Paul VI. Montini would represent the head of the anti-church. Also, the former Jesuit, writer and perennial insider of the Vatican, Malachi Martin, in his book, Windswept House, a Vatican novel, gives details of a double black mass, which took place only a few days after the fraudulent election of Paul VI to the papal throne. On June 29, 1963, eight days after the election of Paul VI, a double black mass was celebrated, in Rome and Charleston, South Carolina, with which Satan was enthroned in the Pauline Chapel, the place where the Pope assumes the role of the guardian of the Eucharist. That particular June 29, 1963, was the beginning of the seventh seal of the Apocalypse of St. John, namely the beginning of the Kingdom of the Antichrist. On that day, the words of Our Lady of La Salette became a reality, Rome will lose the faith and will become the seat of the Antichrist, and the words of Our Lady of Fatima. Indeed, Satan will succeed in reaching the top of the Church. At the conclusion of that double black mass, the Prussian international delegate read the authorization law before those present at the Black Mass in Rome. Whoever, through this interior chapel, would be designated and chosen as the final successor of the papal office, will have to swear, and all those whom he commands, to be the willing instrument and collaborator of the founders of the House of Man on Earth. Thus the new age of man will be modeled. On June 29, 1963, therefore, the new Universal Church of Man was born, of satanic inspiration which had the task of suppressing the Church of Christ, but in a particular way, it had to eliminate the redemption of the sacrifice of Christ on the cross from the face of the earth, and replace it with the blasphemous and satanic redemption of the Triple Masonic Trinity, of which Monsignor Montini was well aware of the geometric symbolic representation, for having personally designed and sculpted it, in 1943. On the tombstone of his mother, Gadita al Jizi, in the cemetery of Verola Vecchia, Brescia. A few hours after the event of the double black mass, Paul VI took the oath as Pope. That oath was a perjury because, de facto, 
Paul VI annulled it with his revolution that saved no aspect of dogmas, morals, of the liturgy, of the same discipline. The fifteen years of Paul VI's pontificate saw the birth and development of the house of man on earth or better of the new universal church of man of satanic inspiration. This was the new church of Paul VI which, according to the words of the Our Lady of La Salette, warned that a black body would eclipse the Church of Christ, the shining body. In the second half of 1963, Father Villa had his second meeting with Padre Pio. It was a decisive and dramatic meeting in which the friar of Pietrelcina ended his conversation with the phrase, Courage, 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 for the Church is already invaded by Freemasonry, followed by the words, Freemasonry has already entered the slippers of Pope, Paul VI. It was Father Villa who made me understand what really happened in that meeting, telling me, on that day, Padre Pio gave me the purpose of my life's mission, Paul VI. When I learned of the phrase that Padre Pio pronounced before he died, my mission will begin when I am dead, I asked Father Villa if this mission was precisely the battle he had to fight to defend the Church of Christ from work of ecclesiastical Freemasonry. He replied in the affirmative saying, Padre Pio passed me the baton, I am the continuation of Padre Pio. Therefore, the task of Padre Pio was to entrust an assignment to a priest for a special mission that only he, due to his sanctity of life and works, could make credible and acceptable to Pope Pius XII, who would confer a papal mandate on this priest so he could carry out this mission. And the mission was to be the author of the first bowl of God's wrath, that is, to unmask the traitors and enemies of Christ at the top of the Church. And in particular that enemy who, in 1963, after his fraudulent election as anti-pope, and obtained with serious immediate threats to the Catholic Church, had initiated the Kingdom of the Antichrist. However, the transfer of power from Padre Pio to Father Luigi Villa was no secret to the enemies of the Church of Christ. Father Villa told me just before he died. Here is what he told me regarding the isolation of Pius XII at the end of his pontificate and the climate of betrayal that surrounded him. Monsignor Basio told me about the phrase he heard from Pius XII about his pro-secretary of state, in the end, even Cardinal Tardini has betrayed me. And also another sentence of Pius XII, I don't know if my words even reach the door of my study. Thus, since the death of Pius XII, the enemies of the Church of Christ knew of the existence and objectives of the papal mandate that Pius XII had assigned to Father Luigi Villa and therefore knew the true purpose of Padre Pio's mission, to fight the kingdom of the Antichrist, that is, to unmask the traitors of Jesus Christ, as Our Lady of La Salette said when speaking of the Apostles of the End Times. They will make progress by virtue of the Holy Spirit and condemn the diabolical errors of the Antichrist. And the diabolical errors of the Antichrist are the substitution of the pure doctrine of Jesus Christ with the pure doctrine of Lucifer, symbolized by the esoteric three triple trinities. The pure doctrine of Christ is summed up in these three sentences, 1. Jesus Christ is God, 2. Jesus Christ is the Redeemer of Man, 3. Jesus Christ is King of the Universe. The pure doctrine of Lucifer, the ape of God, is instead obtained simply by substituting, into the three definitions, Jesus Christ with Satan, namely, 1. Satan is God, 2. Satan is the Redeemer of Man, 3. Satan is king of the universe. And, as Nubius wrote, the best dagger to assassinate the church and strike her in the heart is corruption, the corruption of the people through the clergy, and the clergy through us, the satanic magisteriums of the antipopes of the Antichrist kingdom, Paul VI, John Paul II and Benedict XVI and his crutch Francis, were to promote the three cults of Freemasonry, the cult of the phallus, the cult of man and the cult of Lucifer through the three divinizations, 
1. Divinization of nature, Satan presenting himself as God, 2. Divinization of man, Satan presenting himself as the Redeemer of man, 3. Divinization of Lucifer, Satan presenting himself as King of the Universe, now, these three blasphemous divinizations, that have come to the terminal phase with Bergoglio's magisterium, we summarize them with a text that we have already published. The Divinization of Nature Let's remember the words of the High Mason, Domenico Margiota, the God of the Heavens is the God of Nothingness while Satan is the God of the Universe, since he understands spirit and matter in one being, one cannot subsist without the other. Therefore, everything must be addressed to preserve and protect the nature. Even salvation, sin, soul, supernatural and Eucharist are bound to the nature and to the God of the universe, Satan. Here a synthesis of the divinization of nature taken from Bergoglio's encyclical Laudato Si. Nature is mentioned seventy times while the words, redemption of Christ, mass, true presence, the sacrifice of Christ, confession, the rosary, the kingdom of God, heaven, purgatory are completely absent. Hell is only an asphyxiation brought on by densely populated residential areas that are not compensated by human relationships that give the sense of community and belonging. The salvation of the soul is completely absent, but four kinds of salvation appear that can be achieved with an appropriate relationship with nature. Sin is mentioned four times, only in relation with nature. The soul is mentioned only once, but only to meet God in all things. The supernatural is described as nature that is assumed by God and transformed into mediation of supernatural life. The risen Christ is universal maturation that illuminates everything. On Mary and Joseph, it only says that they help us to protect the world which God entrusted to us. Eucharist, joined to the incarnate Son, present in the Eucharist, the whole cosmos gives thanks to God. The Eucharist joins heaven and earth, it embraces and penetrates all creation. The world which came forth from God's hands returns to him in blessed and undivided adoration, in the bread of the Eucharist, creation is projected towards divinization, towards the holy wedding feast, towards unification with the Creator himself. Thus, the Eucharist is also a source of light and motivation for our concerns for the environment, directing us to be stewards of all creation. Divinization of Man How could man become God without the divine spark in himself, as it is in every small part of the divinized nature? Therefore the Mason who becomes a man-god, which is redeemed by the God of the universe, Satan, is free from any divine authority, being God himself, and then, with full freedom of conscience, he can ignore, mock, insult and blaspheme the name of the true God-man and most holy trinity and express his contempt for Christianity and for those Christians who have not abandoned the faith in Christ God. And in this, Bergoglio's freedom of conscience seems to have no rivals. In the spiritual sphere, what concerns Bergoglio is not the acceptance of Jesus Christ as Messiah and Saviour, but the divinization of the human conscience built up to the supreme moral norm of life, at the expense of the Gospel and God's commandments. Bergoglio stated, God is the light that illuminates the darkness, and a spark of that divine light is within each of us. Therefore, man is God, I cordially impart this blessing, in silence, respecting everyone's conscience, but know that each of you is a child of God. Is it not baptism that makes us children of God? Each of us has a vision of good and of evil also. We must encourage people to move towards what he thinks is good. Was not this the original sin? And I believe in God. Not in a Catholic God, there is no Catholic God, there is God. All. 
The Lord has redeemed all of us with the blood of Christ, everyone, not just Catholics. All. Even atheists. All. Live and let live is the first step towards peace and joy. Isn't this the first satanic commandment? I don't care if this education is given by Catholics, Protestants, Orthodox or Jews. I don't care. What matters is that this child receives an education and ceases to be hungry. The mother of Jesus was the perfect icon of silence, the Madonna was human. And perhaps she even desired to say, lies? I have been tricked. Today, the youth needs three key pillars, education, sports and culture. The world has changed, and the church cannot lock themselves up in the alleged interpretations of dogma, the loaves and the fishes, I would like to add a nuance, they did not multiply, no, it is not true. Dialogue does not mean renouncing one's own ideas and traditions, but rather the claim that they are unique and absolute. We should not think, however, that the gospel message must always be communicated by fixed formulations learned by heart or by specific words which express an absolutely invariable content. Sunday is the day of the family. Proselytizing is a solemn nonsense. I hold the Jewish people in very high regard, whose covenant with God has never been revoked. We cannot insist only on issues related to abortion, gay marriage and the use of contraceptive methods. This is not possible. The greatest evils afflicting the world, in recent years, are youth unemployment, and loneliness of the elderly. For me, hope is in the human persona, in what it has in his heart. I believe in man. I say that I believe in him, in his dignity and in the greatness of his person. For Bergoglio, however, certain Catholics have a different heart and he calls them, fundamentalists, Pharisees Pelagians, Gnostics triumphalists, nostalgic, superficial Christians, the chosen ones, peacocks, pedantic moralists, uniformists, proud, self-sufficient, intellectual aristocrats, Christian bats who prefer shadows to the light of the presence of the Lord, etc. Divinization of Lucifer. The divinization of the man-god is only an intermediate step for the divinization of Lucifer. The lack of faith and contempt shown by Bergoglio for the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, are highlighted by his insults against the Eucharist to the horrible blasphemy to blame God the Father for the death of Jesus Christ on the cross. In his book Refections Espirituales Sobra la Vida Apostolica, Bilbao 2014, Bergoglio insults the Eucharist with the words, Bread and wine in the Eucharist is like going to the tavern with friends. Bergoglio denies the Catholic doctrine on the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist. Bergoglio has never knelt before the Eucharist. Bergoglio has granted communion to remarried adulterers. October 30, 2015, the Declaration, Church, Eucharist, and Ministry, called for extending the opportunities for Lutherans and Catholics to receive Holy Communion together. October 31, 2016, Bergoglio went to Sweden to celebrate, with the Lutherans, the beginning of the fifth centenary of the heresies of Martin Luther. The Vatican published the very grave document, Joint Roman Catholic Lutheran Commemoration of the Lutheran Reformation. Note the following points. 154, the term transubstantiation was abandoned as an explanatory word for the change in the substance that occurs in the Eucharist and says nothing against the terms impanation or consubstantiation used by the Lutherans. In these terms, Jesus would be present through the faith of the group and Jesus would disappear once the celebration was concluded. 158, the Eucharist is described only as a memorial, historical, as the Lutherans have always conceived. 
159, the doctrine that states that the sacrifice of Christ is renewed in an unbloody manner at every Mass has always been professed by the Catholic Church for over 2,000 years was abandoned. However, the war on the redemption of the sacrifice of Christ on the cross was officially declared and widely spread around the world with the logo of mercy and, and the logo of Mater Misericordiae. Where, on both, the symbol of the Antichrist was engraved seven times, which, in an occult language, symbolizes the infinite son of Lucifer. December 15, 2016, in the Paul VI Hall, Bergoglio received persons and children from five continents. To the question? Why do children die? With an attitude of false humility, Bergoglio uttered the horrible curse, is God unjust? Yes, he was unjust with his son, he sent him to the cross. Is it possible for anyone to strike at the sacrifice of Christ on the cross and trample on the immense love of God for humanity, in a deeper and more satanic way than with the horrible blasphemy of accusing God of injustice, for wanting the death of his son on the cross for the redemption of mankind? Only a puppet of the blasphemous and satanic Masonic Triple Trinity could conceive such a thing and hurl such a horrible blasphemy. But the ultimate goal is the realization of Lucifer's dream to regain the absolute power that he had over humanity, prior to Christ's sacrifice on the cross, and thus, bring the solar cult of Freemasonry to its apex where, at the center of a nature, a humanity and a divinized Lucifer, the infinite son of Lucifer will shine, endlessly deified. And this esoterically, symbolizes the total elimination of the sacrifice of Christ on the cross from the face of the earth. To achieve this purpose, the Mass of Pius V had to be placed alongside, a new rite. Thus, while still allowing the celebration of the sacrifice of Christ on the cross, with time, and using the strategy of Nubius to aim at the new clergy in order to bring them, without their knowledge, under the banner of the secret societies, the old rite, could slowly be eclipsed up to the moment when its complete elimination could be imposed. But, as with any self-respecting work of product, even this new rite had to carry a trademark, that could only be the mark of the beast. And this horrible mark could only be this, the possibility, for those who were aware of certain esoteric secrets, to celebrate the new rite not as an offering of the sacrifice of Christ on the cross to the Most Holy Trinity, but as an offering of the deicide in Holocaust to Satan. The infernal reality of this offering to Satan is revealed by Monsignor Leon Myrin, the 18th degree of the Rosicrucian night is a sacrilegious ridicule of the sacrifice of Christ in which Lucifer induces his slaves to offer a bloody sacrifice. The Lamb of God, which the synagogue had crucified, now, is crucified again in effigy, by the Masonic synagogue on the table of the Rosicrucian Knight. This task, entrusted to the Rosicrucian Knights, is the deepest mystery of Freemasonry, the elimination of the sacrifice of Christ on the cross from the Catholic Mass. The Rosicrucian degree is essentially the figured and bloody renewal of the deicide. Saint Alphonsus Maria de Ligori predicted that the Antichrist will truly abolish the holy sacrifice of Christ on the altar, in punishment for the sins of men. These words seem to mean that the Antichrist will officially forbid the celebration of the Mass of Saint Pius V. We can only ask this question, how long will God permit the abolition of the holy sacrifice of the Mass, before intervening and punishing peoples and nations, and what Saint John the Evangelist, calls the throne of the beast, to then throw open the door that will start the resurrection of his church and of all humanity? Did the Diocese of Brescia glorify the diabolical secret of Paul VI Mass? John Paul II's visit to Brescia Paul VI's cause for beatification began in Rome, May 23, 1993, and in March 1998 had a setback due to the publication of Father Luigi Villa's book, Paul VI Beatified. 
That same year, John Paul II came to Brescia, almost to impose the beatification from the top. All of the Brescian participants at the John Paul II event at the Rigamonti Stadium in Brescia, on Sunday September 20, 1998, were faced with a huge upside-down crucifix, that is an overhanging Christ rising from a fire, arching toward the sky, and plunging vertically downwards to the earth below. A scandalous Christ, in an outrageous act of falling, may not be Christ the Redeemer, true God and true man, he, who is the way, the truth and the life. He also said, And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all things to myself. Yet, the crucifix is the undeniable symbol of Christ the Redeemer. Why was the hierarchy of Brescia allowed to exhibit to the faithful of Brescia that crucifix knowing that the Church had always presented the crucifix? for two thousand years, not in that horrible position, but in his serene divine abandonment to the Father. Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. Therefore, a crucifix, while remaining undeniably the symbol of the Redeemer, does not seem to express the love for the man who undertook the sacrifice on the cross, but instead, in the act of falling on an altar, he is associated with the flames in a strange scene full of occult symbolism. Behind the stage, twenty wavy, rusty, metal laminate sheets were erected. They were divided into two groups of ten and arranged in a symmetrical manner, which symbolized flames. The representation of these flames presents an oddity, the flames are less intense at the ends, but gradually grow higher towards the center. However, why are the two flames right in the middle and adjacent, on either side, to the curved cross, not the highest? Why, are they very small, of equal length, almost flat and without the undulating shape of the other flames? Perhaps they do not represent fire, but might they suggest something else to those who can correctly interpret certain quirks? On stage is accessed by a huge and wide central staircase consisting of eleven steps that lead directly to the altar, protected by a drape that has four huge square structures constructed with wooden beams. The squares are of increasing size, starting from the base of the cross and proceeding towards the altar. On the horizontal beam of the last square, the papal coat of arms is fixed at an angle. A traditional crucifix was placed on top of the staircase, on the left and on a support. Why the date of September 20th? On September 20th 1870, with the breach of Port Pia, the temporal power of the papacy disappeared, and that same day, Albert Pike and Giuseppe Mozzini created the new reformed Palladian Rite, the top of all Masonic lodges on the earth, with the said aim to destroy the spiritual power of the Catholic Church. September 20th, therefore, symbolizes the supreme goal of Freemasonry, the complete annihilation of Christianity, and even of the Christian idea. But the spiritual power of the Catholic Church has its roots in the sacrifice of Christ on the cross and therefore, the supreme goal of Satan and of Masonry is to eliminate the sacrifice of Christ on the cross from the face of the earth. Why a Christ who rises from a fire and falls down over an altar? To rise and to fall indicate two axes, that of the traditional cross of the crucified and then the vertical direction of a falling Christ. A Christ who rises from a fire and arches towards the sky is a strange position for our Lord and an even stranger direction, since arching means that, initially, he was directed towards heaven then something caused him to change direction, bending, until it is hanging down. A Christ who falls down is not an expression that indicates an act of love of Christ for the faithful below, but rather an involuntary act that follows certain laws of physics. Now, the flames are almost always associated with hell, 
the abode of Lucifer and therefore we ask, how can Jesus rise from the flames? But the flames could be only a symbol that emanates from hell. Observing the twenty corrugated sheets, divided into two groups of ten symbolizing the flames, we note the strangers of the two flames adjacent to the bent cross, that, instead of being the highest, they are very short, of equal length, almost flat and not wavy. Are these strange flames suggesting something? Separating them from the group of ten sheets, we would arrive at these numbers, nine sheets left and nine on the right of the cross, the two central plates, along with the cross in the middle gives us the number three. The number three, indicated the Antichrist with its three beasts of the Apocalypse of Saint John, while the number three, multiplied by the number nine, which represents the number 18 equals 6 plus 6 plus 6 and that is the number 666, makes up the number 3 times 666, symbolizing Freemasonry's hatred, and the declaration of war against God. The sum of the two numbers 9 plus 9 equals 18 is the 18th degree of Rosicrucian Knights of Freemasonry of the ancient and accepted Scottish Rite, whose main task is described by former Archbishop of Port Louis, Monsignor Leon Myron, the 18th degree is a sacrilegious ridicule of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. At the 18th degree, Lucifer induces his slaves to offer a bloody sacrifice. There, the infernal mystery of Freemasonry is as deep as it is horrible. We are in the presence of a sacrifice to Satan. The Lamb of God, that the synagogue, driven by Satan, has crucified, the Masonic synagogue crucifies him again in effigy, represented by a lamb having a crown of thorns on the head and feet pierced with nails. These new Jews go further, they cut off its head crowned with thorns and feet pierced with nails, as most impure, and throw them into the fire, as a sacrifice to Lucifer the spirit of fire. He continues, what was actually done on the cross, they do as well, but in effigy, on the table of the Rosicrucians. Who is life tastes death, and he who is death triumphs over life. The degree of the Rosicrucian is essentially the renewal of the figurative and bloody killing of God committed for the first time on Calvary, as the Mass is the real and bloodless renewal. The sacrifice of Christ on the cross has annulled the sentence of the loss of eternal life of man, caused by Adam's disobedience to God. The result was that the tacit pact between man and Lucifer was also invalidated, deleted, and abolished. Here, we see the source of the anger of the infernal Lucifer against Christ the Saviour. Now, Lucifer wants to overthrow the act of reparation by the death of the Saviour on the cross, to re-establish his covenant with man and recover the lost empire of humanity. This task, entrusted to the Rosicrucian Knights, is the deepest mystery of Freemasonry, eliminate the sacrifice of Christ on the cross from the face of the earth, that is, obliterate the Catholic Mass from face of the earth. Now we can understand that the altar, on which the head of the crucifix falls down in a vertical line, is not the altar of the Catholic Mass, but it is the table of the Rosicrucian night prepared by the synagogue for the renewal of the deicide. The meaning now is clear, the head of the decapitated Christ, without life, falls in the hands of a Rosicrucian knight who is crucifying him again on the Rosicrucian table, that can be reached by climbing eleven steps which represent the man-god of the Kabbalah and that is connected with the flames of hell, through the four squares that, with their product four by four equals sixteen, symbolize the insof, that is the infinite of the Kabbalah. But, and why then that traditional crucifix? Leon Myrin, in his book Freemasonry Synagogue of Satan, on the subject of the ritual of the eighteenth degree, writes, to the Rosicrucian, the sacred motto, lost and found, is Enri, interpreted Kabbalistically as, 
Egne nature renovata integra, all nature is renewed by fire. He adds, the anticipated fire, as the first agent of nature, as the emblem of divinity, then as divinity itself. Fire is represented in the infernal chamber as a lovely sojourn of Eblis, Hiram and of all the great malefactors known in the Old Testament. The words hellfire is certainly the best sacred motto that the Kabbalistic Jews could propose to the new sacrificial priests of Lucifer, the Rosicrucians. The word, I-N-R-I, that is, the whole of nature is renewed by fire, expresses this holocaust offered by the Rosicrucians to Lucifer, the mastermind of fire. Also, what is actually done on the cross, they do it in effigy on their altar. Why then, is there the traditional crucifix beside the altar? Could this possibly be the missing sacred motto, the rediscovered INRI of the Rosicrucian, in a setting that is becoming more evident that in the height of satanic audacity, they want to renew nature by fire, namely, to overthrow the Holy Trinity in order to put Lucifer in its place by offering a holocaust to Lucifer, himself, the Lamb of God who had, by contrast, offered himself for the redemption of mankind. And is it not then the intention of this offering to Lucifer a way to renew the tacit pact between man and Lucifer that had been invalidated, deleted, and abolished by the sacrifice of Christ on the cross? And is it not done, in such a way as to refute Jesus Christ's redemption by replacing it with the redemption of Lucifer? Why a Christ with horns, and with a snake? Looking at the head of the overhanging crucified, in the midst of the thick rippling and disheveled hair of the Christ, two oddities can be seen. Two horns of equal length and a snake that coils towards the central part of the forehead. Jesus Christ is the Lamb of God, but we have never known him to ever be represented on the cross with two horns. However, in this case, it seems that the two horns are drawing attention to the fact that what is happening is not the bloodless renewal of the sacrifice of Christ on the cross, as it happens during the celebration of the Catholic Mass, but of the bloody sacrifice of the Lamb of God. That the Rosicrucian night offers to Satan, that is the deicide. The most disturbing aspect, however, is the presence of a strange form, like a serpent, at the base of the skull, moving towards the center of the forehead. To understand this symbology, one must refer to the work of Freemasonry that forms the Mason with three kinds of corruption, that of the body, soul and spirit. The agent of this corruption is Lucifer, the serpent which, symbolically, in the corruption of the body, coils around the heart, the center of the effective mechanisms. In the corruption of the soul, it wraps around the lower area of the base of the skull, the center of the formulation of thought. For the corruption of the spirit, it must reach the top center of the forehead, the center of the will, to direct it with his satanic Holy Spirit. What does the symbolism of this snake mean? Since the serpent is shown as positioned for the last corruption, the final phase of the replacement of the Holy Spirit, third person of the Holy Trinity, with the satanic Holy Spirit of Lucifer is being represented. Therefore, it symbolizes the glorification of the triumph of Lucifer over God that is the triumph of the pure doctrine of Lucifer over the pure doctrine of Jesus Christ. The visit to Brescia of Benedict XVI. In 1999, Father Villa published a second book against Paul VI, Paul VI, A Trial of a Pope. And, in 2003, he published a third one, The New Church of Paul VI. After the inauguration of the Satanic Temple dedicated to Padre Pio, in 2005, in Pardignan, in the province of Brescia, there was intense work on the construction of the first church of the third millennium in the diocese, dedicated to the risen Christ, 
which was inaugurated on September 23, 2007, by the Bishop of Brescia, Monsignor Giulio Sanguinetti. The cause of beatification of Paul VI was languishing and had to be resurrected and the only option was the intervention of the new Pope, Benedict XVI. The visit of the Pope in Brescia was set for November 8, 2009. Relating to the positive effects that the Pope's visit would have on the cause of beatification of Paul VI, the Bishop of Brescia, Monsignor Luciano Monari stated, I hope so, not so much for the beatification as such, but as they are convinced that there is a treasure trove of original spirituality in the life of Paul VI, I hope for the spread of this treasure which can help enrich the Church today. But the bomb went off. Just before the arrival of the Pope in Brescia, Father Villa published the special issue of Chiesa Viva in October, the first church of the third millennium, entitled, Brescia, the new parish church of Pardignon is a satanic Masonic temple. The result was that, for the duration of the visit to Brescia, Benedict XVI did not even make a mention of the cause of beatification of Paul VI. The explosive fact of this publication was the central theme of that satanic temple. It was not dedicated to the risen Christ, as stated by the project managers, instead, it was intended for the glorification of the Rosicrucian night, Paul VI and the implicit glorification of deicide that could be consumed on the altar of that satanic temple. Entering the church from the bronze door, on which stands out the Kabbalistic symbol of Lucifer and Freemasonry's declaration of war to God, you find yourself in front of a giant statue of the risen Christ, at the center of a huge stained glass window that overlooks the altar, which is located on a platform, three steps higher than the floor. The statue is at the center of the stained glass window, that is composed by twelve panes, that represent the twelve tribes of Israel of the first degree ritual, with the two highlighted left tribes, Judah and Benjamin. And what is the real meaning of the colors and shapes of the stained glass window and of the statue of the risen Christ? The colors shown in the stained glass window are, yellow, blue, red, green gray, white and gold. The number three and four of the columns and rows refer to the three tests and four elements of the first degree ritual, and this is confirmed by the colors yellow, blue and red of the stained glass window that represent the earth, the water and the fire of the first degree. The color, light blue, is the symbol of the air, that is the Judaic soul, and the color, white, is the symbol of the light, symbol of the Holy Spirit, satanic, instead, indicate the mason who has reached the fifteenth degree of the master mason. And this is confirmed also by the presence of the grey-green bridge that stands out, on the left side of the statue of the risen Christ. In the ritual of the fifteenth degree that represents the emancipation of the Masonic people from the monarchic rule, the candidate symbolizes Zorobabel who freed the two remaining tribes, Judah and Benjamin, from the long captivity of Babylon, and obtained permission from King Cyrus to bring them to Jerusalem. On the way back to their land, however, when they reached the river Starberzani, the passage is blocked but, with force, Zorobabel opens the way and reaches the Judea's capital. The drama of the liberation is represented in three acts, the green space that symbolizes the court of Chiro and a fortress, prison of the Jews, the scene of the bridge, the red space that represents Jerusalem. The first scene is the dark green area that protrudes above the altar which represents the court of Cyrus, while the light green square above it, represents the fortress. The second scene is the green-gray road, green for the place of origin and gray because the candidate is a master mason or man-god, and since black is the color of man and white is that of the divine, the combination gives gray. 
The third scene takes place in the lower red area of the window, which symbolizes Jerusalem. At this point, it is almost tempting to say that the risen Christ statue represents the Master Mason, but we find ourselves before an altar and the Master Mason is a political priest and not a sacrificial priest. So, who actually represents the risen Christ statue? The strange triangular forms of the statue seem to suggest the secret key. In fact, joining the four characteristic points of the whole figure, the two triangles appear that symbolize the completion of the physical triad, Master Mason, 15th degree, and of the moral triad, Rosicrucian Knight, 18th degree, of the second series of 11 degrees, the series of the Masonic Priesthood. Another indication is taken from the three points that overlook the bridge on the Starburzani River, they suggest that three degrees have been accomplished, beyond the fifteenth degree. Then there are three fingers of the right hand of the statue, indicating the presence of another triad, above the two already completed. Another element are the three steps that from the floor of the liturgical room rise up to the altar, symbolizing the elevation of the political level of the master mason to the level of the sacrificial altar, furthermore the statue of the risen Christ is above the altar, signifying the role of the sacrificial priest. Another element, yet, is the golden color of the window that forms the background of the statue. The golden color, in fact, is the dominant color of the apron of the Rosicrucian knight. Entering the liturgical room under the statue of the risen Christ, or even better yet, of the Rosicrucian knight, there is the altar that commemorates the rolled stone of Christ's tomb, while the wounds of the risen Christ, carved on the three sides, accentuate the deeper symbolism. But these three wounds are represented by three great busted signs and this is a satanic hoax, because the great busted sign symbolizes reincarnation, or the transmigration of the souls into other bodies, exactly the negation and the refusal of the resurrection. But the project manager of this first church of the third millennium declared that this altar is allegory of Christ, priest, victim and the altar of his own sacrifice. Now, from the analysis of all the measurements of hidden symbols that have been imprinted on this altar that represent Lucifer under several forms and with his number doubly sacred, 77, the number of the Jewish Kabbalah, the ASR. Masonry and the Rosicrucian Knight of the 18th degree. At this point, in this special edition, it was stated, now, we are obliged to ask ourselves this question, when we celebrate a mass in a Masonic Satanic temple and over a similar altar, do we celebrate the renewal of the bloodless sacrifice of Christ on the cross, offered to God the Father, or do we celebrate the bloodless renewal of the deicide, executed for the first time on Calvary, and offered to Lucifer? After the study of the tabernacle and of the processional cross, where the measurements refer to Lucifer and to his redemption, to the mark of the beast, of the Kabbalah, to the church of Lucifer, to Masonic ASR, to the sacred Jewish tetragram, to the Kabbalistic god, Lucifer, to the Rosicrucian knight, and to the cults of Phallus, of man and of Lucifer, we continue with a study on the Virgin of Hope that should represent Our Lady, Mother of God. The project manager also affirms that the sculptor has created a new representation of Mary, she is Our Lady of Easter Dawn, the Virgin of the Eighth Day, the Mother of Hope. What is striking about this statue is the complete absence of symbols which give it the due recognition of the Queen and Mother of God, a precious crown on her head, a crucifix in her hands or on her breast, the baby Jesus in her arms, a sacred heart encircled with thorns, in an attitude of a sorrowful mother. Nothing at all of this. Yet, at her feet, there is a sacrificial dagger with a golden handle. But then, 
What does this golden image represent? Under the statue, it is written, Virgin of Hope and the project manager said that this is a new image of Mary. Consulting the Masonic Dictionary of Troisi, the Dictionary of the Symbols of Chevalier Gerbrandt and the Masonic Symbology of Boucher, under the heading. Virgin, we have discovered these definitions, indicates the six-pointed star or seal of Salomon, she governs the consciousness that comes out from confusion and the birth of the spirit, the masons are sons of the widow, that is of the nature ever virgin, Isis, the widow of Osiris is the Masonic Lodge, we are all sons of the same father, Hiram and we remain in agreement in the common defense of her widow. Monsignor Myron confirms, sons of the widow means, sons of the synagogue of Satan. And what is that dagger with its golden handle at the feet of the virgin used for? With a virgin of hope that can no longer be confused with Our Lady, and with a dagger with a golden handle, the same color of the Rosicrucian knight's apron, there remains only one consistent hypothesis, this sacrificial dagger is offered by masonry to the Rosicrucian knight, symbolized by the risen Christ statue, to reach the height of Lucifer's audacity, receive the offering of the renewal of the figurative deicide of the deicide committed for the first time on Calvary. There is another strange coincidence, upon entering the liturgical room and moving towards the Virgin of Hope and once we arrive at short distance from her statue, at a certain point, we feel almost encouraged by the left arm of the Virgin of Hope to turn our gaze to our right, where we discover the figure of the risen Christ, or even better yet that of the Rosicrucian knight and, under his right hand, a white and pointed triangle is displayed that has the shape of a pointed dagger. Is the Virgin of Hope suggesting to us that the sacrificial dagger at her feet is needed for the Rosicrucian knight of the 18th degree, to strike the fatal blow to the crowned lamb to be offered in a burnt holocaust to Satan? But this Virgin of Hope, namely Freemasonry, has a golden halo of diameter 40 centimeters, the golden color of the Rosicrucian knight, and the number 40 which symbolizes the waiting, the trial, the punishment. And what is the meaning of all this? Is the meaning that the Rosicrucian knights must allow a certain period of time to pass, waiting, and in meantime, must they perform the figurative deicide on the altar, trial, and then, once the sacrifice of Christ on the cross has been eliminated, replace the sacrificial mass with the deicidal mass, punishment. The glorification of Paul VI as the greatest Rosicrucian knight. We can't talk about Paul VI and his pontificate unless we take note of the double black mass that took place June 29, 1963 in Rome and in Charleston and with which Lucifer was enthroned in the Pauline Chapel. From that day, the Kingdom of the Antichrist was born and a new Church of Satanic Inspiration, the Church of Man on the Earth had to model a new era of man, with the addition ironclad rules for the election of Paul VI as successors. The fifteen-year pontificate of Paul VI put into practice the substance and content of the diabolical oaths made by the prelates, at the end of that double black mass. Paul VI, in defining the new mass, without the sacrifice of Christ and without the true presence in the Eucharist, found the oppositions of the cardinals Bocci and Ottaviani, but perhaps this was only just a device to make the expression God of the universe pass unnoticed which referred to Satan and that represented a seed that, over time, would have sprouted and prepared the ground for the total subversion of the mass sacrifice into the mass deicide. As supreme head of the new and reformed Palladic Rite, Paul VI, necessarily would know only too well the meaning of the words, God of the universe. After his death, and always with occult language and symbolism, the glorification of Paul VI as the greatest Rosicrucian knight of all times began and at the apex of this glorification was to place Paul VI on the altars. On May 24, 1986, the Mason, 
Monsignor Pasquale Macchi inaugurated Paul VI monument on the sacred mountain of Varese, north of Milan, that was glorifying Paul VI's three acts of treason toward Christ, his church and Christian people. In 1998, due to the setback of Paul VI's cause of beatification, created by the publication of Father Luigi Villa's book, Paul VI Beatified. John Paul II came to Brescia the same year, to impose, more or less, his beatification from the top. But as we reported in the previous pages, the occult scenography, prepared at the Stadium of Brescia, was the horrible sacrilegious ridicule of the sacrifice of Christ where the Masonic synagogue crucifies him again, in effigy, represented as a lamb, in which they cut off the head and throw it in the fire as a sacrifice to Lucifer, the spirit of fire. And the altar of this sacrifice found itself in the midst of Kabbalistic symbols connected to flames of the hell behind it. But John Paul II surely had to know what was represented, considering that in 1978 he had replaced Paul VI as the supreme head of the new and reformed Palladic Rite and represented the second beast coming from the earth of the Apocalypse of Saint John. And he must have known, as well, the diabolical secret of Paul VI's Mass, in which the sacrifice of Christ offered to the Most Holy Trinity, was substituted by the deicide offered to the God of the Universe, Satan. In 1999 and 2003, Father Villa wrote two other books against Paul VI, and Paul VI's cause of beatification suffered a new setback and needed to be revived, and the only possible way was a visit to Brescia of the new Pope, Benedict XVI, who came to this city, November 8, 2009. But just before his arrival, the bomb of the Satanic Temple of Pardignan exploded. And Benedict XVI must surely have known of the reality of the Satanic Temple of Pardignan, not only because of the presence of his pontifical medal, on the consecration plaque of this Satanic Temple, but also because most of the occult symbolism that were engraved in this temple were later discovered on almost all his liturgical signs. Since Benedict XVI had replaced John Paul II, in 2005, as the supreme head of the new and reformed Palladic Rite and as second beast coming from the earth of the Apocalypse of Saint John, he must have known the diabolical secret of Paul VI Mass, in which the sacrifice of Christ offered to the Most Holy Trinity was replaced by the deicide offered to the God of the Universe, Satan. The diabolical secret of Paul VI's Mass consists of the ambiguity in still allowing the celebration of the sacrifice of Christ on the cross, while, anticipating and enticing new priests to march under the banner of secret societies, abandon the sacrificial Mass and then celebrate a Mass which is already an offering to the God of the Universe, Satan, and one that the Rosicrucian Knights even now can celebrate not as the sacrifice of Christ but as the deicide. The new kings will be the right arm of the Holy Church, that will be strong, humble, pious, poor, but fervent in the imitation of the virtues of Jesus Christ. And men will live in the fear of God. Our Lady of La Salette